Thank you very much. Thank you, a wise woman. <laughs> um, uh, good to see you all here. Uh, what I'm just going to talk about today is something called um, uh, an enlargement of our citizen science project, the um, citizen project. It's called HLF3 up here uh, because it's the third time we've asked H uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund to support our endeavours. Um, what we're doing is this, which is recording threatened coastal heritage assets, as it says in the National Planning Framework. Um, we're, our sole concern is those features on the foreshore threatened by natural erosion, which sit outside the um, National Planning Policy Framework. I, nobody else cares about them. <coughs> Uh, if, it was, if there was a redevelopment, they would fall under the National Planning Policy Framework and developers would give um, money to evaluate, investigate and mitigate those developments. If they were all scheduled monuments, they may, may get some statutory protection, but the majority of our foreshore features, which are uh, a unique resource, vital for our island history, there are many things on the coast you only find on the coast, and yet we're allowing them to wash away uh, because no one can be bothered to uh, deal with them, allegedly. Uh, so what we did in 2008 to 2010, or rather in 2006-07, we approached the Heritage Lottery Fund um, to ask them if they would um, support uh, the Thames Discovery Programme, which was a, a regional community-based response to recording um, coastal heritage assets on the foreshore which were being destroyed by um, tidal action and they very kindly said yes and um, amazingly thanks to Natalie's good work even after the heritage lottery money ran out in 2010-2011 uh, she was able to keep that going uh, from 2010 right the way through to the present day so we started off just with a boost of Heritage Lottery Fund money, for which we're eternally grateful. And um, Natalie and her team, Elliot, Josh and Helen, have been able to keep it going uh, as a sustainable entity. And that's important, as we'll come back to you later. Uh, HLF2, uh, from 2014 to 2017, will drift into 2018, is the Citizen Project. Uh, which you'll hear far more about tomorrow, and that's uh, a national community-based uh, model of looking at material which is being destroyed on the foreshore and on the coast by natural agencies, um, in increasing river levels, extreme storm events, and so on and so forth. And what the wonderful citizen team have done, uh, many of whom are lurking in this room, is a developer a, a nationwide modus operandi uh, galvanising communities across the country to look at, uh, initially it was uh, 20 key sites geographically disposed ar ar around the country uh, to try and get uh, a national view of the different types of foreshore. The foreshore in London is very different from the foreshore in North Northumbria, for example. So we needed to build up a, a national system of how you deal with very different sites. Uh, I should say, while Pete, Peter Murphy is in the room, that uh, we were much inspired by the uh, um, what used to be English Heritage uh, Rapid Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys, which were the first um, um, state-sponsored study of the entire coast all the way around England, uh, which uh, attempted to give us a, a data set, a first view of what actually was on the foreshore. And this went from the 1990s, and I think the last one is almost finished now. So it's been a very long, hard job with um, um, historic England archaeologists walking round the entire foreshore of the English coast, looking at stuff. Uh, and we're very grateful for them to do it. And as a direct consequence of their work, uh, and there's Peter there, stand up, wave to everybody, and then sit down again. That's the man who's walked the entire coast single-handed, single-bootedly. <laughs> so we're very grateful to his work. And as a direct consequence of that, uh, we were able to persuade Heritage Lottery Fund to try and not just do 
a, a, an English heritage officer walking around the country, but get a community involved in looking at that stuff. Uh, you'll hear all about that tomorrow, but what I'm going to talk about today is a, a new revised version of that, uh, what we call HLF3, uh, which looks at a, a national, cross-sector, sustainable, community-based response. So I hope you're all uh, to recording our threatened coastal heritage assets. So I hope you're all taking notes, uh, which requires a much increased public engagement raised profile and um, a much increased public participation to get the job done. So I hope you've got all that. Um, this is... <laughs> ah, that's interesting. Uh, just, just wait one moment. Oh. <laughs> All oh, right, that's it. No, it's not. That's, uh, that's the citizen team. Sorry, Stephanie, for bringing you out first. Um, we have, that is the entire team that we're trying to do the whole country with the entire professional team, which is why we need so many other uh, individuals. We have Stephanie overshadowing the whole thing. Oh, yes, excellent. Uh, Stephanie is overseeing the whole thing from the offices in um, Museum of London Archaeology. Our Southeast team is uh, Lara and Oliver, uh, who, some of whom may be here. Our Northern team is Megan and Andy. Where are you? Oh, yeah, there yeah, they are. See, they are here. They're not in the north. And our um, Southwestern team is uh, Teresa, Alex, and Lauren, and I'm not sure who this person is. I'm not sure why they're there. But, uh, it's public participation, obviously. Very keen to do. So that is our entire team, which is why we need so many other people. Um, you'll be hearing about what they've been doing, which is amazing, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is how we, we hope, fingers crossed, uh, to move forward in from 2018 onwards with we've just put in another application to HLF, the third attempt uh, to try and change, uh, to try and have a, what we call, what we told Heritage Lottery is a whole new approach to dealing with the um, coastal archaeology. Uh, as we go through and as you've just had a, a day of TDP works, you'll notice that we've stolen many of the ideas from the Thames Discovery Programme, but please don't tell them that. Uh, and especially please don't tell Heritage Lottery Fund that. Um, uh, you'll also notice one of the people on here, she's probably gone now, but uh, the original ah, the original application uh, was, uh, help, was drafted very much by this little person over here, who was Courtney Nomura, who was here earlier, uh, for, for whom we have a debt of gratitude. And also we have an immense debt of gratitude for all that lot, uh, who actually proved that you can use uh, human beings to record the fossil. <laughs> Right, uh, what we're doing is, uh, we are slightly changing it, is that we are moving away from just foreshore archaeology to what we call coastal archaeology. Uh, so we're looking not just at your threatened coastal heritage assets, your archaeological features, but also at coastal change itself, how the, uh, the English coast is transmogrifying and as well as the threatened coastal archaeology. To do this, we need to up our game, and we're using increasingly high-precision recording. Uh, you've seen... Uh, here's, here's something which we developed all on our own. Uh, we, we use, for example, 3D modelling, which you've seen some examples of that. We use a lot of drones. Oops, sorry, yes. Uh, we increasingly use drones because the foreshore is often a bit muddy, and if we don't want to get muddy, uh, we just send out a drone to do the work for us. And we also use uh, lots of apps, we use smartphone apps, or we're encouraging the, the wonderful public to use their smartphone apps to record things that they found on the foreshore, send us back the information, how it changes day by day, and uh, using high precision recording techniques to plot these things out in much greater accuracy. A, so we can find it, and B, we can uh, determine how much it's changing. So, um, high precision recording of the past. And we think this 
um, is not just looking backwards, but this is helping us understand the future of coastal change, how coasts are eroding. This is something you'll see tomorrow. This is a 3D modelling of a site in Brown Sea Island, which uh, Lauren did for us. And that's what it looked like in 2015. Supposing you had to go and draw all those bricks in the rain with a 6 8 pencil and um, then you have to go back the next year and draw all those bricks. <laughs> much as we love bricks, it's much easier to do it 3D modelling, which is a very accurate way of monitoring change on the foreshore, which is why we, we use 3D modelling. Um, but we're interested not just in the features, but in coastal change itself. And if you've ever been to Fafix by the sea, uh, you and ever been to Berlin Gap, you'll have gone down that one, two, three, four bay jetty and down onto the foreshore in 2013. And if you stay down there for a couple of years and then came up in 2017, you'll have noticed it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bay jetty because the cliff face has eroded back that much in four years. Uh, the coast is changing at a very dramatic rate and uh, since we're down there recording the coastal heritage assets, we might as well record the coastal change and therefore help people who own the site, in this case the National Trust, the speed at which erosion is taking place. Uh, so we're informing the future. We're actually helping people uh, protect their, or at least moderate, uh, mitigate for future change. Uh, this all came from the work that you heard Elliot Ragg discussing earlier. By recording, for example, the stuff at the Tower of London, where I think we first recorded in 1996, if you can believe that, and there was the old Thames Archaeological Survey. We found the shuttering for Tower Bridge, which is I'm not very tall. I was still not very tall. But those timbers there, which have been um, sawn off, are shuttering for Tower Bridge, which is. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 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 the coffer dam to build Tower Bridge. Sadly, it's slightly longer. <laughs> and so, uh, when we examined it in 1996, you can see that the foreshore level, both sides of the, sh of the coffer dam, is the same level. And that happens to be that particular stone key is actually built by somebody called Geoffrey Chaucer, again, that same civil servant in the um, late 14th, early 15th century. It's the earliest operating stone key in the country, or the lowest levels. But if you look over here, you can see next to that half metre scale that the foreshore has dropped very considerably in the space of 15 years by half a metre, almost a metre. And when we back again, not only had the medieval masonry been exposed, but the medieval foundations have now been exposed. And not only had the medieval foundations been exposed, they're now being undermined by the scour of the tent. So uh, Elliot and his team pointed this out to historic royal palaces, and the abundant agency, and they have now rock armoured the site. So uh, it was simply the work of the Thames Discovery Programme using their year-on-year -year records to demonstrate the speed at which that was happening, and they were able to persuade historic royal palaces, World Heritage Site, that unless they rock armoured that, the key would fall down, the tower would fall down, the ravens would fly away, and we'd lose the empire. <laughs> So uh, that is why, uh, much inspired by that work, uh, the new citizen project looks not just at the um, heritage assets, the archaeology on the foreshore, but we're very now interested in, while we're down there, recording evidence of coastal change. And to do this, we also need to um, uh, log evidence for relative sea level change, the indicator points which demonstrate where um, sea level used to be. In addition, I'll come back to that in one second. Uh, our other themes are lost landscapes, you know, submerged forests and things, lost settlements, which are now being inundated by the sea, coastal industries, very specific to the coast, uh, salt working, uh, various quarries, uh, fishing, fish traps, that sort of thing. Yeah, I woke her up there. 
um, coastal de defences, uh, because we're an island and we keep getting invaded, or in the good old bad old days we did, most of our defences are on the coast. So if we lose all our coastal defences, we'll lose all the evidence for those, those bits, and of course, boats, ships and barges, which you usually only find on the coast. So there's a huge amount of evidence of our island history which is only on the coast. And we're losing it desperately. Now look at this top slide, which is taken from Peter Murphy's brilliant book on the subject. You'll see um, that you can see the line of the um, coast of the sea wall as it is in, in a place in Essex. And you can see how they clearly the sea wall has been breached and repaired, etc. And in the foreshore, which is exposed, you'll see a number of red blobs which represent what are called red hill salt working sites. So there's extremely good evidence for sea salt manufacture in these great red hills, which are the detritus from uh, cooking up seawater to crystallize out the sea salt. And you'll notice the ones in the north are late Iron Age uh, or Roman, and they'll be most inland, and they'll be built just above the high water mark as it was in the late Iron Age or Roman period. The ones and the features further down the beach are Lake Bronze Age, I, the river level is lower, and the ones down here are Neolithic, lower again. So each one of these sites gives you a, a relative sea level indicator level there, there, and there, provided you have the high precision equipment to record that. So you're not only recording uh, ancient industry, a salt, sea salt manufacturing industry, you're also able to record um, relative sea level change and therefore project sea level change forward into the present day. <coughs> right, uh, so what we're going to do is, um, apologies to the TENS Discovery Programme, we're going to invent six more discovery programmes. Since the TDP works so well, we're going to invent the Humber Discovery Programme, which will surprisingly be on the Humber, the uh, Liverpool Bay Discovery Programme, which will look at the Mersey and the Dee, the Blackwater Colm, which is in Essex, uh, the East Kent Coastal Discovery Programme, the Devon Rivers Discovery Programme, and the Solent Harbour Discovery Programme. Each one of these will be run a bit like that organisation, the TUP, but this time we're going to embed them in universities. That is to say, we're going to get um, them to collaborate with us uh, on our uh, survey days, uh, on our community outreach events, etc. And we've persuaded the University of Hull, the University of Liverpool, uh, University of College London, University of Winchester, University of Southampton to um, uh, not only support our bid to the HLF but to agree to work with us uh, on our summer seasons, on our public outreach work, and you know. Uh, share facilities, lecture theatres, drones, GPS kits, students, etc. So um, we want to embed these solidly in the university so that the universities can give us the list of support we need to continue these after the HLF programme disappears. Now each one of these programmes will be using the same citizen methodology and uh, we aim to integrate university staff, university students with the um, local coastal communities, bring them together and learn from each other. Um, interestingly enough, each of those six <coughs> or seven, um, six programmes, or seven if you include the seven which we may or may not do, um, at least six of them are actually in the areas called the shoreline management plans. This is sort of a, a local authority, DEFRA, Environment Agency planning system that looks at shoreline developments. It just so happens oh, that we have one in the Humber, in, in, in number one, uh, the northeast group, one in the East Anglian group, another one in the, uh, the Kent Coastal group, etc. etc. So, uh, we can integrate our work with the work being done in the real world uh, with the shoreline management plan people. 
and that's something we'll come back to later because we believe the information we're gathering about sea level change and coastal change will be of interest to those dealing with the shoreline management plans for their region. So we have a sort of focus uh, for the work that we're going to be doing. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? Right. Uh, these new programs, uh, we're also going to have something called foreshore recording observation routes. <laughs> so, so not only will there be tennis frogs, there will also be hammer frogs and liver pew frogs. Uh, <laughs> what's all this hissing? <laughs> uh, and you can all be one big happy family. Look how happy these Sussex frogs are. Um, did I, did I didn't tell you. <laughs> well, so your, your, your frog blogs will now come from all parts of the country. I knew you wouldn't mind. Um, and, and what's more, you, you, Thames frogs can go and visit Humber frog sites, and Humber frogs can come and visit Thames. Tower. Yeah, right. You all be one big happy family. Right. So that's the first part of what we're going to do. So I hear you say, these new flagship discovery programmes are all very well. <laughs> well, what about rest of the girls? It's <laughs> 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 all very well, but what about the rest of the girls? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> um, I have the very answer here. Uh, well, it's, it's a good, good point, actually. Um, <laughs> if we are doing a national project, and yet we're only in those little black dots, have you noticed how all four shores are circular? It's, uh, what we, we do have a problem for a national program, even if these are very good samples, focused and detailed, intensive work. What are we going to do with the rest of it? And here's the answer to that. It's called our Responsible Stewardship Programme. Now, um, there's a lot of people own bits of the coast. Uh, people like the National Trust, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Birds, <laughs> National Parks, <laughs> Wildlife Trusts, Country Parks, Areas of Outstanding Natural Beauty, etc., etc. Um, and these are all conservation minded bodies that have large bodies of volunteers. So we thought if we establish a coastal conservation consortium, we could bring all these people together and persuade them to, um, persuade them to develop a set of guidelines, best practice, for how to deal with the coastal homage assets being eroded on their sites, the ones that they manage, own or manage. So the guidelines for the preservation of black animal, because they have a gas that's threatened by destruction caused by natural agencies, uh, they'll have eight sections. It'll look at our general coastal heritage asset strategy, it'll look at a coastal heritage asset database, then it'll go on to consider what these agencies already do for a development-led survey. They're obliged under the National Climate Policy Framework. If there is a redevelopment, they have to do something about it. Have to do a survey, mitigation, evaluation. So we convert that into this is a new thing, an erosion led survey. But instead of doing mitigation and evaluation, as you do there, we'll ask them to do a monitoring program. And not only looking at the heritage assets, but also at the coastal erosion. So this is the sort of new bit. <coughs> and to enable them to do that, we will offer them free training. <laughs> Citizen training, so we're all doing things to the same um, standard, and um, we'll also increase things for their volunteers to do, uh, increase their community engagement. Right, um, we will give them this free training for their staff and wardens. The idea being, once we've trained their arrangers, then their arrangers will train their volunteers. We don't have to do that, and that way we can extend our national coverage uh, right the way around the country. And I'll show you how we're going to do that. Nobody believes a word of this. Um, there's our survey teams working on these very specific locations, 
And that's where we will focus all our summer season work, all our training, all our outreach, etc., and all our research on very specific, uh, very important areas. But you'll notice that um, what about all that area there? What about that area there? What about all that area there? Well, it just so happens that the National Trust had 50,000 volunteers, and they also just happened to have 775 miles of coast path. All the way along there, all the way around there, and all the way around the southwest. The southwest coast path is already open, and it fits all the way around here as well. So if we can persuade the National Trust to let us train their wardens and officers, we only need to train about 20 of them, and they will train 10, 20 of their volunteers. So we can get 500 volunteers from the National Trust to do all those other areas. Then we approach the National Parks. We just happen to have the uh, North York Moors, the Broads, South Downs, New Forest, Exmoor, etc. Only six national parks hit the coast, so we only need to train six officers from six archaeologists from the national parks and get them to train uh, 50 of their volunteers, and that'll give us another 300 volunteers to deal with all those bits. And of course, each one of these comes for their own, each one of those volunteer groups comes for their own interests in habitat, birds, seals, or whatever. So we're getting, we're increasing the skill space of our volunteer members. And then if we approach the Royal Society of Adventure of Wales, and you'll see here are just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 sites which have large bird reserves, often in estuaries, which are often uh, full of interesting archaeological sites. Uh, they have 195,000 volunteers. So all we have to do is to train whatever it is, that's 12, 13 <coughs> RSBP rangers, and they will train even a small portion of the 195 volunteers, um, or 18,000 volunteers, wherever it is, uh, to work for citizens when they're out counting birds. So you count <laughs> birds in the morning, for sure archaeology in the afternoon, so uh, it, it all works extremely well. <coughs> so if you think this is impossible, if you look at what Citizen actually managed to do in those three years, um, our three groups were targeted to train uh, 300 people over a three-year period. Now, I think if we are training these conservation-minded agencies, we only have to train about 50 of those, to be honest. So uh, we know we can train 300 in a year, uh, we know that because we actually overachieved and we trained not 300 but 1,245 people in three years. So we think training 50 rangers and wardens should be relatively easy. Uh, we were asked to, um, <coughs> to put on at least 30 training events per year and we managed to do 110. So we know we can do it. So we can put on the training events for these conservation-minded agencies and get them training their own volunteers and filling up the rest of the coast. Symbols. <laughs> um, we also need to up our um, public profile. And to do this, there is a thing called the English Coast, England Coast Path, which has been formally opened in 2020, uh, right in the middle of our project. So what we're going to do there is um, that's the coast path on the so-called land. We want to develop the concept of low tide trails, which is trails along the actual foreshore, uh, where a number of important foreshore features uh, sometimes can be seen. So with all due respect to health and safety, etc., and all those due caveats, uh, we want to uh, mirror the English coast path with an English foreshore path, as it were, for our low tide trails to explain how the rest of the coast's history, our island heritage, is actually on the foreshore at a suitable time of day. But uh, we will give them warning that tides come in as well as out. <laughs> um, so, and we'll be working with National Trust on that, we hope. We also have to 
up our publication game, make sure there are plenty of reports deposited with the Archaeology Data Service and lots of um, articles, features and conference proceedings so that academically and publicly people understand what we're doing. We have a wonderful website, but we must up our game on that. And we need to... Uh, we also have a, an amazing TV series coming out next year, uh, which is Britain at Low Tide. So you can see how we're trying to bring all this together. So we believe um, our community-based discovery programs embedded in universities will uh, give us a bit of research clout, introduce students into the uh, coastal communities. Responsible stewardship, uh, so that will be embedded in universities, our responsible stewardship uh, will give us the guidelines, uh, the agreed guidelines to implement through their wardens and rangers and therefore the wardens and their volunteers and the monitoring work will be embedded in those agencies. So even if, the actual, if we don't get any money after three years' time, at least all those agencies will continue to carry on the work that we're doing because it's embedded in their work. Uh, and the more we can up our profile, with our media, our media profile, TV programs, and all the rest of it, the more that will help us to um, enhance, to persuade those uh, conservation-minded bodies to um, come on board, etc., etc. Uh, so they all integrate. All those three things come together. So, um, in terms of after the heritage lock-in and it disappears, we will try for a fourth go. <laughs> but I'm slightly worried about that. Uh, we have four funding streams we can possibly go for um, for 2021. Uh, we will charge for guided walks, training, and workshops. We will try and get commercial sponsorship for our summer season surveys uh, for our six discovery programs. We will try and pack down research grants through the universities. And we'll also take on. Um, a commercial arm, as it were, to try and get contracts, archaeological paid contracts for flood defence work, which is why we need to tie in with the shoreline management plan <coughs> people. Uh, if we have an ongoing, well publicised, high profile uh, project going in the Humber estuary, we're more likely to be able to generate commercial work for flood defence in that area, etc., etc., etc. So, again, all those four things will be predicated on the um, next three years being successful. Well, that's the dream. <laughs> I had a dream. <laughs> Our application to Heritage Lottery Fund has only just been submitted, and we won't know the result until December. So all of what I just said <laughs> <laughs> may be so much hot air. But if we are successful, and we can establish a national, <laughs> sustainable, cross-sector, community-based response to the preservation by record of coastal heritage assets, written by the structure of national agencies, through the seven and six discovery programs and new coastal conservation authority and new resource protocol. If we can do that, 